Hello and welcome. My name is Dr. Akasemi Newsom, and I'm Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies here at the University of California, Berkeley. We are honored today to have Dr. Leona Vaughn, who is the Vulnerable Populations Lead Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research as a speaker today. She will be giving a talk entitled Tackling Labor Exploitation in the Cocoa Supply Chain. This event would not be possible without the generous co-sponsorship of the Center for African Studies, ISSI, the Institute for Social Research, and the Institute for Labor Research here at the University of California, Berkeley. A bit about our speaker. As mentioned, Dr. Leona Vaughn is affiliated with the United Nations University Center for Policy Research. She holds a doctorate in sociology, social policy, criminology, and a master's in social research from the University of Liverpool in the UK. She has over 25 years of experience working as an equalities and social justice expert, both nationally and internationally within higher education, civil society, and government including as Chief Executive of the UK hate crime charity, the Anthony Walker Foundation, and as non-executive director of the Liverpool Football Club Charitable Foundation. Dr. Vaughn also worked on the first ever public prosecution policy on race hate crimes as national policy advisor at the Crown Prosecution Service for England and Wales, and pioneered an award-winning positive action scholarship scheme with the UK Attorney General's Office to address the persistent underrepresentation of Black prosecutors. More recently, at the University of Liverpool, Dr. Vaughan has worked on a number of interdisciplinary international projects with academic, civil society, and community-based partners researching risk, vulnerability, and labor exploitation globally, and the impacts on racialized and minoritized populations, especially women and children. Her work includes the Clothes, Chocolate, and Children, Realizing the Transparency Dividend Project, researching the impact of the Transparency and Supply Chain section of the UK Modern Slavery Act of 2015. It looks closely at the lived experience of workers and children in the cocoa and garment sectors in Bangladesh, Ghana, Dominican Republic, and Myanmar and enhancing safeguarding and efforts to address modern slavery through the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a project that is an exploration of safeguarding concepts and victim survivor-centered practices in anti-slavery, anti-trafficking community-led research projects in Western, Eastern, and Central Africa. Uh, lastly, in this extensive accomplished biography, in 2020, Dr. Vaughn led a consultancy team to deliver the UK Collaborative for Development Research International Consultation on Safeguarding, part of the research community's response to the abuses revealed in Haiti. The resulting report and safeguarding guidance was adopted by all UK research councils within the collaborative. Without further ado, uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Vaughan and the floor is yours. Many thanks, Dr. Akasami. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, so, as you said, my background is um, I'm a sociologist. I'm researching risk prevention and safeguarding. Um, but my most current role is with the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking Initiative at the United Nations University Center for Policy Research in New York. So a little bit about the initiative, the Finance Against Slavery and Trafficking, also called FAST initiative, was launched in mid-2018 as a multi-stakeholder partnership in response to calls from the G7. Oh, I'm just trying to change the slide. Thank you. Um, the G20 and the United Nations General Assembly to mobilize the private sector in the fight against modern slavery and human trafficking. So the output from that partnership 
which was called the Financial Sector Commission, was a blueprint, as you can see here on the slide. Um, now, this blueprint, blueprint is a um, document which provides a framework for the sector to address slavery and trafficking. So FAST is now a donor-funded project within the UNUCPR, so that's the Centre for Policy Research, developing work to progress the vision that was set out in those blueprint goals. So let me just walk you through the goals of the, um, of the blueprint. So the first goal is about compliance with the laws against modern slavery and human trafficking, so supporting the finance sector to address that issue. The second is about knowing and showing modern slavery and human trafficking risks. So helping them to identify the risks in their supply chains, but also um, within financial flows that they manage and handle. The third is about using lever leverage creatively to mitigate and address modern slavery and human trafficking risks. The fourth is around providing and enabling effective remedy for modern slavery and human trafficking harms. And the fifth is about innovation for prevention. And like I say, this was part of the blueprint which provides the whole of the financial sector and the professional service providers within that um, space to demonstrate their commitment to accelerating action to end modern slavery and human trafficking. So what do we mean when we talk about vulnerable populations, which is um, my role? So my role within FAST, um, I undertake and oversee survivor-centric and survivor-informed research, which generates insights for the finance sector about how they can improve their contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals, to eliminate slavery and trafficking, through working to reduce the risk of exploitation and abuse of populations who are most vulnerable to slavery and trafficking. So therefore I'd say that vulnerable populations, we use that as an umbrella term to incorporate not only those people with lived experience of slavery and trafficking, but also populations who are impacted by poverty and inequality. So those structural factors that generate such difference and disparities in the world, including global South populations, people on the move, and those negatively impacted by racism, sexism, homophobia, homophobia and disabilism. So you'll see here, I've given a definition of the vulnerable populations term. It has its roots in health and development, um, particularly approaches mm. to addressing human rights and the needs of marginalized groups um, who may have been discriminated against by policy and practice. So that is our sort of orientation when we talk about vulnerable populations. So on the macro level, vulnerabilities can clearly be reduced when we reduce poverty and inequality. And on the micro level, the lived experience of victims and survivors, which have been relayed through um, practice and research, show that their vulnerabilities to exploitation and abuse are often related to financial exclusion. So the initial vulnerabilities that we hear about from victims and survivors of slavery and trafficking refer to being unable to access a formal and affordable loan or line of credit, especially for migration journeys, of being unbanked and therefore reliant on cash-based work. But all of these things put these populations at the mercy of what we call the shadow economy. And this often results in modern slavery situations such as debt bondage and or trafficking. And equally, this can apply to survivors and their vulnerability to re-victimization when they continue to be excluded from financial, well, the formal financial systems um, as a consequence of their trafficking experience. So this often relates to them having a lack of identification, a lack of permanent address, or a credit history that's been damaged by traffickers. So FAST's position is that improving the financial inclusion of victims, survivors, and at-risk populations contributes to reducing the risk of slavery and trafficking. 
So I'll just outline the lecture. That, that gives you a little bit of a background in terms of the initiative itself and my, my role. So in this um, talk, what I'm hoping to cover, it is quite a lot. So I may skim over some of these things um, because there's a lot of ground to be covered here. And I want to prioritise really what the current research is telling us about reducing vulnerabilities. So I'll talk about eradicating modern slavery and human trafficking, what the international agenda is. I'll also touch on supply chains and the legislative developments, particularly in the UK and Europe. And then we'll go into talking about cocoa. Cocoa as a high risk sector, but also cocoa in relation to the research that we're undertaking at the moment in Ghana and what I, insights that is offering to us. So let me start with eradicating modern slavery and human trafficking, what the international agenda is. So there's no global definition of modern slavery. It's often used as an umbrella term for a number of phenomena relating to labour exploitation, including, for example, forced labour and trafficking. So just to, to help you here, um, a, a couple of definitions. The first is the Forced Labour Convention of 1930 that the ILO um, published to say that forced labour is all work or service which is exacted from any person under the threat of a penalty and for which the person has not offered himself or herself voluntarily. But trafficking was later defined in the UN Palermo Protocol. Um, and this protocol is its formal title to prevent, suppress and punish trafficking in persons, especially women and children, supplementing the United Nations Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime. This protocol um, is an international convention adopted by the UN General Assembly in November 2000, and it explicitly acknowledged that despite the existence of a variety of international instruments containing rules and practical measures to combat the exploitation of persons, especially women and children, there is no universal instrument that addresses all aspects of trafficking in persons. Thank you. So it went on to define trafficking in persons as the recruitment, transportation, transfer, harboring or receipt of persons by means of the threat or use of force or other forms of coercion, of abduction, of fraud, of deception, of the abuse of power or of a, a position of vulnerability or of the giving or receiving of payments or benefits to achieve the consent of a person having control over another person for the purpose of exploitation. Exploitation shall include at a minimum the exploitation of the prostitution of others or other forms of sexual exploitation, forced labour or services, slavery or practices similar to slavery, servitude or the removal of organs. So that gives you an oversight in terms of the international definitions relating to modern slavery. And these very much underpin what we refer to as the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They came in in 2012, and they have a specific focus on slavery and trafficking. And I'm gonna talk about the target 8.7 in particular. So in the Sustainable Development Goals, like I say, modern slavery appears in a number of places. Um, sustainable Development Goal 5.3, for example, covers issues of forced marriage or child marriage. 16.2 seeks to end abuse, exploitation, trafficking and all forms of violence against children. But it's 8.7, which explicitly outlines the goal to end modern slavery, forced labour, trafficking and child labour, as defined by the ILO conventions. The target here is to eradicate forced labour, modern slavery and human trafficking by 2030. Now, unfortunately, you can tell that that is not far away. Um, but even more of a pressing agenda is to eradicate child labour in just three years time in 2025. So I think it's important to look at what the potential scale is of this social problem. What you're seeing here is a, a map provided by Walk Free, 
um, the Global Slavery Index um, of 2018. So the orange identifies medium risk countries, but the darker the, the, the darker orange, almost red, are the high risk countries. So they're the countries with the highest prevalence of modern slavery. So the estimate is that 40.3 million people um, are in conditions of modern slavery. Now that estimate came from 2016 data, it's due to be updated later this year. The data also indicates that modern slavery and human trafficking is a gendered phenomenon. So it's not only globally specific, it is gendered, with men estimated as most likely to be in forced labour and women most likely to experience trafficking. But let's go back to the map. You can see that the prevalence is highest in some of the poorest countries of the global south, especially in Africa, Asia and the Pacific region. Paradoxically, it is estimated the forced labor alone generates over 150 billion US dollars each year in the profits from abuse and exploitation of the world's poorest people. And that's an estimation. That's probably a, a moderate estimation. 99 billion of that is linked to commercial sexual exploitation, 51 billion from forced economic exploitation including domestic work, agricultural work, and other economic activities. But within that, agriculture um, was, the agricultural sector was estimated to generate 9 billion in US dollars each year. And I'd like to just hold on to that figure because we're gonna be looking more closely now at the issue of cocoa. So, before we go into cocoa, I just want to touch on the fact that those estimate, estimates were, you know, almost seven years old. Um, and we have a clear indication that modern slavery is actually very likely to be on the rise. Child labour and global extreme poverty rose for the first time in two decades, especially in countries of the global south in 2020. Nine million additional children around the world are at risk of being pushed into child labour as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and deepening parental familial poverty. And more than that, research indicates that the intersections of poverty and inequality within the pandemic are exacerbated by armed conflict as well as the climate crisis. And these are driving global vulnerabilities to slavery and trafficking to extreme extents. So just on climate, in terms of how it impacts um, on the African continent, the World Bank's 2021 Groundswell Report reports that by 2050, 216 million people across six world regions will be forced by the climate crisis to move within their countries, but the hotspot areas will emerge as early as 2030. And for the region that it refers to as sub-Saharan Africa, it says as many as 86 million internal climate migrants will be on the move. As the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, puts it, COVID-19 infections and climate hazards, such as heat waves, wildfires, and poor air quality, combine to threaten human health worldwide, putting vulnerable populations at particular risk. And these populations are at risk, obviously, to many things, but they are specifically at risk to slavery and trafficking, particularly in the supply chains of goods and products from the global south to the global north. So supply chains, what is happening with legislation? So I'm gonna focus here on the UK and Europe. The key legislation in UK and Europe the Modern Slavery Act in the UK was introduced in 2015, one of the earliest pieces of legislation to address slavery and supply chains. The Netherlands introduced their child labour due diligence law in 2019. Germany have a supply chain due diligence act, um, which they passed in 2021, but comes into force in 2023. But very currently, um, the 
the European Union draft mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence directive is being consulted upon in terms of synthesizing some of this legislation across Europe. So like I say, there's existing and there's forthcoming legislation in the UK and Europe. And these pieces of legislation aim to improve transparency and due diligence in supply chains, but they offer differing levels of requirements. Some are voluntary, some are mandatory, differing levels of consequence for non-compliance. And that's where the EU offers an opportunity for not only synthesis, but also to ensure equity in terms of how companies will be not only um, required to act, but what they should do when they find slavery and trafficking risks in their supply chains. The EU um, draft requires large EU companies and some non-European companies doing significant business in Europe to assess their actual and potential human rights and environmental impacts throughout their operations and down their supply chains to take action to prevent, to mitigate and to remedy identified human rights and environmental harms. Companies that fail to conduct effective due diligence or to implement preventative or remediation measures face both administrative penalties and civil liability. But the detail is, is still to be determined. And many question the impact of the existing supply chain transparency legislation in terms of what those companies have done in UK, Europe and beyond on uh, ensuring that slavery and trafficking not only is addressed and identified, but is, is remediated. So let's zoom in on cocoa here. Cocoa is an agricultural sector known to be at high risk of slavery and trafficking, specifically in West Africa. I think it's important to acknowledge as well that cocoa is not an indigenous crop to West Africa. It was introduced by European Euro-American colonization. Um, cocoa can be used for multiple purposes, including the beauty industry. But here I will focus on cocoa and the chocolate industry. For the last 20 years, the West African cocoa sector has been recognized as being beset with labor exploitation issues, mainly child labor. The main response by the public and the private sector to the revelations on the latter, and those revelations came through journalistic exposure um, rather than any sort of uh, interrogation of, of the practices, but what came out of that uh, journalistic exposure was something called the Harkin Engel Protocol in 2001, also called the COCO Protocol. Now, this was a voluntary agreement between government, the global cocoa sector, cocoa producers, cocoa labourers, and non-governmental organisations to eliminate the worst forms of child labour in the growth and processing of cocoa in two main countries in West Africa. Côte d'Ivoire and Ghana. The protocol set out six actions that were supposed to lead to the establishment of an industry-wide standard for product certification by 2005. This was then extended to 2008, and by 2010, it was virtually abandoned. Um, so you can see that there are issues here around voluntary arrangements. And today, modern slavery persists. You know, it's like I say, over 20 years. The cocoa supply chain in Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire is reported to still involve over 1.56 million child workers and 30,000 adults in modern slavery. The Global Slavery Index places cocoa in the top five riskiest imports for the G20 countries. So does that have an impact on what the cocoa sector and the chocolate industry, um, the profits it generates? Well, no. The industry continues to grow, both in terms of reliance on cocoa, um, cocoa beans from this particular region, and in terms of revenue and profits for chocolate companies. 
Global chocolate industry is today worth over $150 billion US. How interesting that that is the same figure that we see in terms of slavery and trafficking um, profits. $150 billion annually and forecast to grow to over $182 billion by 2025. So this is a growth industry. And like I say, the reliance on beans from the region has not lessened between 60 and 70% of the beans that are used by this uh, industry are from West African smallholders. So not just from the region, actually from smallholding farmers in the region. So let me just move on to what I mentioned before in terms of the question, in terms of has legislation had an impact on the sector? On the left, you'll see a BBC News report on the 2021 US Supreme Court findings that survivors of, cha of child slavery on cocoa farms in Cote d'Ivoire could not sue Nestle and Cargill because the abuse happened outside of the US. So this case is called Nestle USA Inc. versus Doe. On the right is the findings from a small sample analysis that I undertook for a British Academy funded project that um, Dr. Akasemi mentioned before on clothes, chocolate and children. This uh, small sample analysis was three years after the Modern Slavery Act was enacted. But you can see that the findings really speak for themselves. 34 modern slavery statements were analysed. 10 of those 34 did not meet the basic legal requirements for the modern slavery statements that is outlined in the legislation. And furthermore, child labour was not addressed in detail in any of those 34 statements. Quite often, there was a blanket statement of we will not use child labour in our supply chains. So this is in spite of those supply chains being known to be high risk. There were no proactive examples of increasing visibility at all tiers of the supply chain to ensuring legal child workers were protected from exploitation because not all children in the supply chains will be working unlawfully. They didn't address providing remedy when child labor was found and they didn't ensure that the value chain for their products were adequate for enabling farmers to rely, to not rely on their children or the children of others to work on the cocoa farms. So it's quite easy when we look at this data to understand why questions still persist around how seriously the legislation is impacting on multinational organizations and if existing or proposed legislation will have any positive impact on the sector. So that gives you some background in terms of the international agenda for modern slavery and human trafficking and the, the challenge to try and reduce this by 2025 and 2030 respectively, the challenge of legislation and some of the legislative gaps um, in relation to supply chains, but I'd just like to talk now about the research insights that we've gathered from Ghana. So Earth Shattering is a project, um, a rapid research project implemented from November 2021 to April this year. In fact, we're, we're still working on the, the, the findings. And it was delivered as a partnership of VAST, UNUCPR and the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa, also called UNU INRA. Now, the purpose of this project was to explore from a survivor-centered perspective, the potential finance-focused interventions that can be made to address the interrelated challenges of the climate crisis, COVID-19, modern slavery, and human trafficking in Ghana's cocoa and gold sectors. Okay, I was just making sure that the bells had stopped chiming. <laughs> okay, so in Ghana, it's interesting. Um, so we looked at the cocoa and the gold sectors. Um, it's interesting because these are sectors that geographically overlap in the country. Um, artisanal small scale gold mining and cocoa farming often happen on the same areas of, um, of, of land. 
And therefore, there's an intersection as well between exploitation in both sectors. So like I say, this was a rapid study. Um, we wanted to scope the issues that are at play and identify possible preventative interventions. It involved a review of current policy and legislation, such as what I've just outlined, but also the strategies within the country uh, relating to the issue of modern slavery in these sectors. It involved 15 key stakeholder interviews, uh, semi-structured interviews with government, multilateral, civil society, non-governmental organizations and finance sector actors, as well as secondary analysis of 40 interviews from people within affected populations in Ghana. And the latter access was provided by the University of Liverpool COCO Research that I mentioned before, that we undertook with Kwame Nkrumah University for Science and Technology in 2018 within the Ashanti region. On the 23rd of February, we undertook a round table in Accra to discuss emerging issues within the, the research with key government, private sector and NGO stakeholders. Um, it's important for me to acknowledge that COVID-19 has impacted and delayed this project, as I'm sure that many of you have experienced, um, but I'm happy that I'm, I'm able to share with you some of the early indications that are emerging from this work. So a little background on Ghana, modern slavery and cocoa. Cocoa represents almost 30% of the national exports of the country, generating almost 2 billion in US dollars in revenue. Ghana is the second largest producer in the world after Cote d'Ivoire. And in 2018, 3,700 adults were found to be in modern slavery in Ghana and 14,000 children were found to still be working on cocoa farms. The pandemic impacts in the region are very much believed to have increased child labour, although there are no statistical impacts as yet, and modern slavery within the country. So, like I say, the figure is expected to go up, not only because of the pandemic itself, but the consequences of the pandemic in terms of increased poverty, decreased employment opportunities and school closures. So I just want to just give you an overview of the Ghana cocoa value chain. Um, and this figure is adapted from Balch et al. and Fountain and Hoots Adams. Supply chains are pretty much sort of self-explanatory. You know, it's a transaction. Um, for value chains, in a lot of ways, is different because it considers the processes for adding value from the raw material to the end product. And in turn, it means that we need to consider how that value is distributed along the chain. And that's why we talk about the value chain here. In this figure on the left, you can see, well, you might not be able to see actually, because <laughs> um, it's quite small, but um, despite Ghana's unique government oversight and price setting role in the sector, you know, and Cote d'Ivoire has a, a similar uh, role too, that only four to 6% of the cocoa value goes to farmers and workers and laborers. Between four and 6% of the entire value chain. 24% goes to traders, processors and manufacturers. And the vast majority is enjoyed by this group here, the merchandisers and the retailers who enjoy between 70 and 72% of the value chain. So part of the issue underlying this wide gap is reported to be that farmers sell their beans no. in local currency. So they sell their beans in cities. Um, but beans are, caught, are bought from cocoa traders and processors in US dollars. And transactions from this point forward continue in that currency. Irrespective of that, the fact still remains that cocoa farmers are in extreme poverty. That is, you know, not even, uh, to be argued against. Farmers' income is on average 84 US cents per day. Um, and that, that figure comes from uh, Fountain and Hutz Adams. That is well below the extreme poverty line um, that is set of US 125 per day. So 84 cents per day. 
The living income de differential was introduced in 2019 by the government of Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So that places a premium on the export price of cocoa for the 2021 season, up to 400 US dollars per ton. And the, the intention of this is to provide an improved income at this point in the chain for farmers. But from what we heard from our research was that this is not doing it enough. It's also a voluntary arrangement. So let me say a little bit more. The early indications um, from our research around modern slavery um, was that participants spoke of quite often of organized movements of people, um, particularly from Togo, um, but all other, also other bordering African countries. It was unclear if all would meet the slavery and trafficking definition. Oh, sorry. Just jumped around there. But some appear to, especially for children. So um, children um, and internal migrants from the Muslim North to the predominantly Christian regions of the Ashanti um, was a common occurrence and quite often seasonal. Um, and quite often as well, and this is part of the challenge, involved family and kinship networks. So the, the overall challenge here is very much about um, differing levels of practical understanding and definitions within organizations and institutions of slavery and trafficking and what that means. Um, there was low financial sector and other sector awareness of modern slavery. There was a high sensitization, interestingly, to child labor in some sectors, but not to other forms of modern slavery. So the issues that I touched on before around the uh, distribution within the value chain was not necessarily seen through the lens of exploitative practice. It tends to just focus on our children present on the plantations. So just on the financial sector, I think that um, the low awareness of modern slavery issues also meant that they were unclear about what their role was in terms of identifying any types of financial flows but also what their role was in helping reduce vulnerability in cocoa communities. Again, going back to the, 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 the inequity of the, of the value chain. So the next um, early indicator is around COVID, COVID and children and modern slavery. So we were told that children in female-headed and poor households often were viewed as important income earners, especially during the pandemic. We were also told that farmers did not qualify for any social protection payments during the pandemic because they were classed as being business, businesses. Um, so you can see here you've got the dynamic of farmers who've got their children at home because children are not in school, the cost to keep their child at home, the cost to feed them, etc. And there's no work for adults. And there's a shortage of labour because of the clampdown on movement. So this really makes up a very complex landscape. You know, the inability to access school during the pandemic, the quality of school, school even outside of the pandemic, the quality of schooling, the cost of school fees, the, the cost to send a child to school. There were also issues that were relayed to us about the need for children to gain an understanding of the livelihood. So what we call livelihood training and knowledge to maintain a cocoa farm. So farmers were very keen for children to understand how to maintain the farm because actually that was a way of them maintaining land rights in the country. So like I say, this is a very complex landscape around children and COVID and modern slavery. Um, children were present in the cocoa sector, absolutely. Um, a lot of this wor work was described as hazardous, especially to health, but also to education. Um, but also there are long-term issues in terms of what is happening in Ghana during the pandemic, 
may jeopardise long-term education for children and young people. A lot of these children have missed almost two years of school. Um, they may have to stay in work because they're now too old to go to school. Um, they may be excluded from rejoining their class because of their age, or their families may just be very reliant on the income that they generate. So the picture is not um, simple. So modern slavery and financial inclusion was a major, um, a major theme in the research. We were told that there were positive changes for cocoa farmers, um, their income uh, believed to correlate with a reduction of modern slavery in the sector. So interventions to address cocoa farmers' income in turn reduced child, um, child labour and modern slavery. The living income deferential and the recently implemented digitised payments for previously unbanked farmers were cited as having a specific positive impact. So farmers who were supported to access financial services were you know, saying that this was a positive thing, but also they said that there were challenges. Um, so access to business banking and loans was not offered to farmers. They were offered basic banking services. Um, now this poses a challenge for proving income in terms of, you know, if you're a business, you need to prove what your income, your outgoings mm -hmm. are for loans or investments. It proved a challenge for them to manage their finances. But also when you think about labor exploitation, it posed a challenge to, for them to be able to demonstrate transparency in their payments of workers. Also, um, there's the issue of literacy and digital literacy. It was reported that farmers did not always have adequate literacy or digital literacy to understand how to manage digitized payments, mobile money. So they were given this access to help during the pandemic um, to ensure that they still receive payments, but there were still problems. Um, you know, and mobile money is something that is increasingly popular as an, an alternative to physical banking, particularly for rural communities. Um, we were told that often farmers were exploited. Um, people would say, you know, we will help you. We'll act as an intermediary for your digital payments, but then their money would disappear. Um, so there's lots of issues around safeguarding um, this vulnerable population, whilst also at the same time, increasing their financial inclusion. The other challenge is the Ghanaian government's e-levy. So from February this year, the Ghanaian government introduced an e-levy on electronic transactions, including mobile money payments. And this was often received as an additional tax on income. So farmers who were saying, well, actually, this is a positive thing. We're now, you know, we've got access. We can see the money that we're um, earning. We can access that money easily. We're now saying, well, actually, if we do it that way, if we, if we manage our money in these mobile money wallets that we've been given, we are going to experience an additional tax. Now, whilst they didn't say explicitly that this would um, have a consequence in terms of child labor and modern slavery, it's implicit that if they are then, you know, they're increasing their income to then see their income decreased again, that the increased risk is that farmers will once again rely on their own children or the children of others to work on the farms and or exploitative migrant labor. So this is a real issue. The next early indicator is around due diligence. So human rights and labor rights due diligence actions and cocoa value chains were often claimed to have significantly reduced the worst forms of child labor in cocoa. Um, cocoa companies, sustainability schemes where they existed were felt to increase access to remedy for survivors especially farmers' children who were working. But this also had its challenges. You know, um, sector-specific interventions and strategies just focusing on cocoa 
did not really impact on the overall risk of modern slavery and trafficking to the vulnerable populations in those communities. So in a way, focusing just on cocoa actually exacerbated exploitation in other sectors. So it displaced the children who would ordinarily be experiencing exploitation. It displaced the migrant labor who would ordinarily be experiencing exploitation into other sectors. So we were told that children who were formerly on the cocoa farms were now appearing in the artisanal gold mining sector, as well as in street work, as well as in sex work. So you can see that, you know, there needs to be some synthesis here around interventions and maybe sector specific interventions in isolation and not having a positive impact or as positive an impact as they could. Also, there were concerns that companies equally were operating in silos. So rem remedial actions through the sustainability schemes were seen as potentially prioritizing the increase of cocoa yields rather than prioritizing issues around human rights and due diligence. The last slide I'm gonna talk about is on climate profitability and sustainability. We were told that extreme climate change excessive heat, heavy rain, long periods of drought were severely impacting farms and the cocoa crop yields. We were also told that environmental damage was affecting farmers and communities, particularly through deforestation and artisanal gold mining, which in turn pollutes the waterways, affects the, the land quality um, and so on. We were also told that the cost of farming was increasing exponentially. And so we have challenges here. Farmers are unable to access business banking services to be able to get loans to, to buy the pesticides that are required um, and the, the other fertilizer, et cetera, materials. And so for them, they were saying the sustainability of cocoa farming in the country is next to zero. They perceive that the cocoa sector is under extreme threat, not only by climate change and the environment, but also under extreme threat because there is zero profitability in this for them. Um, so like I said before, they were unable to access COVID support. They don't get business support or loans for farming. And so they were increasingly talking of their keenness to sell the land, even if it was for informal and some illegal gold mining. So I'll just sum up here. Um, the next steps for this research is to review the research findings with the, um, the knowledge consortium that we've established in Ghana. And this is a consortium of survivor organizations and local stakeholders who have guided this research. It's to actively disseminate these findings and mobilize the finance sector, not only within the country, but also across the continent and internationally to address these challenges for agricultural sectors. Um, to reduce the vulnerabilities for these populations who've been impacted so extensively. The final report will be published by summer 2022, um, and that dissemination activity will follow from there. So in summary, there is still issues to address within the cocoa sector. There's inequity within the cocoa value chain. There's interconnectedness of social and environmental problems. But there's also the potential of stronger legislation and sanctions. There's also the opportunity for more public and private partnership collaborations to identify, address and prevent vulnerabilities. And specifically for the finance sector, they have a key role to play here. And the finance sector in all its forms, not just the formal, but also the informal, very local um, finance sector. Because if economic factors have such a large part to play in vulnerability, and they also have a large part to play in protective factors. So I will end there, Dr. Akasami. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Vaughn, for that very enlightening and interesting uh, presentation. I will kick off the Q&A with a few uh, questions of my own. So the first uh, had to do with the um, new financial tools being offered 
to the farmers uh, in, in West Africa, such as mobile banking. Uh, it was it's very interesting to hear that new opportunities are being offered for uh, the farmers to be included in, in sort of modern uh, finance and banking. However, it did make me think of the term predatory inclusion, one that has emerged in the US context when it comes to the post-civil rights um, legislation allowing for racialized minorities, particularly African-Americans, to uh, gain access to mortgages uh, in the US housing market. Uh, is such a concept or a parallel concept in use in your research? when it comes to the inclusion of farmers in the cocoa industry? And uh, how do uh, the finance companies uh, that you're working with um, respond to the prospect that these new tools um, may harm as they uh, do good? Thank you so much, Dr. Sammy. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that this, unintended consequence of um, increased inclusion uh, can be that actually, you know, like we, like I talked about, you know, there's a, a big push to get them, the farmers to be banked in a way to try and help them to have a consistent income. Um, but then also there are the additional costs to operate that, you know, not everybody has a, a mobile phone, not everybody has access to, um, to, to, you know, sort of to credit for their phone even. Um, so this is one of the things that we will definitely be uh, talking to the finance partners that we work with. So like I say, it's not just the large formal financial sector um, that we want to be involved here. We want cooperatives involved. We want rural banks involved. We want to explore the most appropriate interventions that provide farmers with the support that they need. Um, rather than this isn't a market expansion, which is what I'm, I'm taking, you know, when you talk about predatory inclusion. Um, this is around trying to ensure that farmers are protected and enabled to demonstrate transparency, because the more that this legislation comes in in, in Europe, in the UK, you know, the, it's the farmers who will have to be able to demonstrate, well, the workers that we use are not exploited. So if we are holding them to the same standard of legislation as multinational companies, which, you know, in effect we are, because those companies are only going to say to the farmers, well, we need to, to comply with this law. How, how do you show us that you're complying as well? Then there needs to be appropriate tools for the farmers to be able to demonstrate that. Um, so like I say, there was majority smallholder farming. So these are farming families. Um, it's not a big sort of industrialized process. Cocoa tends to not be um, in that way in Ghana. You know, it's mostly smallholders. Um, so it needs to be appropriate to their needs, but it has to also ensure that we safeguard uh, them from any further exploitation, not just by predatory individuals, but, you know, sort of by predatory systems, as you, as you mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll open it up to other colleagues. Yes. So we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Yeah. Um, they're on a couple of different topics. So apologies if we sort of bounce around. That's okay. But one of our um, audience members asked, has the US developed a protocol for supply and chain due diligence in tandem with the EU and the UK legislative agendas, particularly the ones that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk? Did you want to give me all the questions and I can take them? Oh, oh yeah. sure, sure. Okay. Um, then we have a second question along similar lines. What headway has there been in a reputable and standard slavery-free label for cocoa and chocolate products in the U.S. and globally? And then the last question, which you touched on already a little bit in your previous response, but is the mobile network coverage sufficient in Ghana to avoid equity issues in access to mobile money? Okay, I'll take the last question first. That's the easiest to answer. Um, the answer there is no. 
Um, so there's an absolute need for uh, investment in the digital infrastructure for Ghana. Um, so particularly the rural areas do not get that level of, of coverage. Um, so, you know, this poses a, a massive challenge. You know, even if farmers do get access to that, they need to travel to an area where they get coverage, um, which is why so many intermediaries potentially become involved um, if they, they, they have a mobile, um, mobile wallet, digital money. Um, so yes, so, you know, this, it raises the issue around digital inclusion um, and if that is being done in an equitable way um, and whether the infrastructure is there. Um, I mean, I would say that if the infrastructure isn't there, then there, there has to be alternatives. And this is where, you know, we really want to explore what those alternatives could be um, with the various stakeholders. So that was the last question. And I'll do it in reverse. Um, has headway been made with the slavery free standards? I think that the intention of the Harkin Engels protocol was to try and get to a slavery free chocolate. But we have to acknowledge with all of these different things happening within the cocoa sector and the cocoa supply chain, that slavery free at this moment in time is not a possibility. Um, so identifying exploitation, identifying slavery-like um, conditions and addressing those, I think is a more proactive way because quite often when you set a standard of slavery free, then you kind of narrow your vision to not see other things that are happening. So, um, you know, and there's a, a, a large company called Tony, Tony Chocker Lonely, um, who have written quite a lot in terms of, you know, it's a, it's a, it started off as wanting to be a slavery free chocolate. Um, I think it's headquartered in the Netherlands. Um, but they even say, look, this is not, you know, this is not a possible, um, you know, end point. This can't be the, we can't get there without addressing all of the other inequalities that are happening. So the systemic inequalities, the, pov the extreme poverty, the unequal distribution of the value chain, you know, all of these things, until all of those things are addressed, you can't possibly get to a product that you can, with any sense of integrity, say is slavery free. So, and then to the last question, which was around the US um, supply chain developments, there's a lot happening in the US. Um, I didn't focus on the US for this, um, for this uh, lecture. They, the US is, I would say ahead of the EU in some senses, in terms of some of the sanctions um, that they've uh, imposed in terms of uh, imports, particularly uh, on uh, issues around the fisheries and cotton. I don't know whether there is a plan to try and synthesize these two um, areas of legislation. It makes sense that there should be because these multinational corporations operate in a globalized sense. So it would make sense for that to happen. Um, but I, that's not my area of expertise. That's not the area that I was uh, focusing on. But I would say that, you know, that there are, there's a lot, a lot that is positive happening um, on the US supply chain work. Um, that equally, the EU could learn from the US and the US could definitely learn from the EU. Yeah, sure. I'll just take the question from here. Okay, so thanks for a very insightful uh, presentation on many of these dynamics and the broader context and the specifics to Ghana. Um, I felt like I heard a great deal about what's happening in Ghana and in West Africa, but not a great deal about what's happening in uh, the global north. Mm. Uh, you've spoken some of that in, in the present. Can you tell us a bit more about, for example, uh, Who's mobilizing to challenge these issues in the global north? Because, of course, the people in Ghana wouldn't be producing at these rates unless there was a demand, which mm. we know there is in, yeah. in the global north. Yeah. So can you tell us a, a bit more about, you know, for example, you know, who, who's mobilizing to challenge the global north? Who are the institutions besides the obvious, yeah. the usual yeah. suspects that people should be targeting on? Yeah. And what is the possibility? I know there's the Modern Slavery Act mm -hmm. in Britain. But this also is introduced around British immigration policy. 
to yeah. control people coming in, as well as its ostensible goal of, of preventing slavery. So, so yeah, they're my questions. There's a few questions in there. There's a um, few questions. In there. So, yes, often the legislation is on anti-trafficking is rolled in with anti-immigration. Mm -hmm. um, that is, has been well written about, um, you know, and is, is widely accepted to, to, to be the conversation mm -hmm. across multiple countries. I think in terms of the Global North mobilization, there's a lot of pressure that's coming from non-governmental organizations. Um, there's also actually quite a lot of pressure coming from, um, from customers, you know, mm -hmm. to say, actually, we're unhappy with the situation. Um, so I think that there's, it's happening on multiple levels. Um, and a lot of people never thought that we would get to the point of, of a draft mandatory due diligence mm -hmm. um, coming out for the EU. Obviously, that now doesn't include the UK, um, which is a challenge. I don't know what the UK plans are um, around that. I think that that will probably be part of the discussions, especially for companies who are based in the UK. Um, but the EU legislation kind of covers them because it talks about not only companies that are based in the EU, but companies that have a large customer base in the EU. So, um, the you know, they may have to address it anyway. Um, but yeah, I think the mobilization is definitely coming from non-governmental organizations, but there is actually quite a lot of in-country mobilization um, to address these issues. So there are organizations within Ghana, uh, places like Challenging Heights, mm -hmm. Defense for Children International, who are very solidaridad, you know, very, very vocal um, in terms of particularly speaking to the companies directly who are based in mainly in Europe um, about their practices. So and is there, okay, then. And is there far more consumption of chocolate in Europe than in North America? Yeah. Oh, I'm not sure about North America. But yeah, I mean, in terms of Ghana is not, um, it's not a chocolate consuming country. Yeah. Um, but I mean, who are, they, yeah. who are they selling their cocoa to? Is it, is it overwhelmingly to Europe? It's overwhelmingly to Europe and yeah. the US. Yeah. Good, thanks. Wonderful. So I also have a question that follows up on the issue Stephen, uh, Professor Small brought up. Uh, could you uh, say a bit about the role of political parties in mobilizing around the legislation mm. um, in the European countries? Do you see, for example, uh, green parties or left parties being more interested in supporting um, this, um, this kind of le le legislation against um, modern slavery, or is it something that um, parties across the political spectrum are interested in supporting? Yeah, um, I mean, I'd find that hard to answer for, for the whole of Europe. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that there tends to be political support for um, particularly uh, due diligence um, legislation. Um, I think increasingly as people start to understand the intersections of the climate crisis, you know, that, that actually slavery and trafficking doesn't exist in a vacuum, that these things are interconnected, that there are a lot more um, sort of, there's a lot more activism which touches on these issues. So that makes the links between, you know, preservation of the environment, environmental damage, you know, and the practices um, to produce particularly cocoa, but also other, other goods and commodities that come into, into Europe. Bring anything from our colleagues on Zoom? Not yet, but I do have a question myself. Great. It touches on a slightly different topic, but you had mentioned the sort of interrelatedness between exploitation within the cocoa sector and then also the gold sector. I'm wondering if there's been any legislation introduced to try to deal specifically with the interaction between those two, or if we consistently see them being treated as two separate issues. Yeah. Um, in terms of legislation, I ha haven't seen any legislation that tries to address both of those things, but certainly 
one of the the the, the, lev the levers that we're trying to sort of pull upon is the national strategies. So to try and get national strategies, government strategies, um, Ghana's just drafting their latest action plan on slavery and trafficking, to try and get them to think about exploitation, vulnerabilities in the broader sense. Um, obviously, you still need to mobilise sectors who are you know, particularly present, but trying to think about, for example, let me give you an example. Within some communities, which were traditionally cocoa farming communities, they had really terrible weather, wiped out the crops. The farmers then increasingly sold their land for artisanal gold mining. But artisanal gold mining brings a lot of informal labour, and then you also get a knock-on effect of sex work and other types of exploitative activity to almost service this new community that's arrived. So thinking through different ways that exploitation happens and vulnerabilities from a strategic point of view. So thinking about children and education, how do we make that more accessible, more likely to keep children in, in, in school than on the farms or in other places where they shouldn't be? Um, that needs to be within government strategy, government policy. Um, and there needs to be a collaborative approach here. You know, I think that what we saw in particular was the cocoa sector has had this magnified um, approach. You know, there's been a lot of attention, a lot of um, action, some with a positive impact, some with a not so positive impact. Um, but just doing that on its own has what Lafito calls the balloon effect. I don't know if there's any criminologists in the room, but you know, you, you clamp down on one area and the other area explodes. So you can clamp down on child labor in the cocoa sector, but then children just appear elsewhere um, and are more in more dangerous, more vulnerable, uh, more violent um, circumstances. So we need, I think, to have policies and strategies that think about safeguarding these vulnerable populations from any types of exploitation rather than kind of this very um, myopic approach to cocoa, cocoa sector, cocoa sector issues. Um, but that's just one thing that we're trying to sort of facilitate a conversation about. You know, how do we get people to work collaboratively? How do we get the cocoa companies to be just as interested as in children appearing in sex work or street vending or um, the artisanal gold mine as we do the other way around, you know? Um, so, and I think that, that that really, rather than operating in silos, that the, 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 the most progress, and like I say, 2025 is right around the corner, you know, child labor, 2030 for all forced labor um, and modern slavery, the most, the most progress that we're going to make is actually to, to address these things together because they are interconnected and they are interrelated. If I may ask a follow-up question then. So in terms of what you're talking about and trying to get different sectors working together and having this very sort of large <laughs> macro view of how everything is working, do you see it as a greater challenge trying to get different sectors to work together within a nation? for different countries to work together to mobilize on a consistent international you know, regulation for these sorts of things? I think that it probably involves different, uh, different tools and different methods and different processes. Um, I couldn't say sort of abs with absolute certainty that one is more difficult than the other. I think that um, what, we, what we do have is with the European Human rights and due diligence is an opportunity to be thinking in the more broader human rights framework, which helps then mobilise countries and nations around human rights issues. Um, but what you've also got with, with companies within countries is, you know, things like, for example, in the finance sector, we have the ESG agenda, the environment, the social, the governance goals. So there's an agenda here which addresses three goals that are very much interrelated the environmental damage, the social impacts, the governance, particularly with this uh, project, which I didn't talk that much about, which is around gold, 
which are a major commodity for the finance sector. So there's opportunities to, I think that the more levers that we can pull and press, the better that, you know, the response will be. Um, so it, it's obviously different on an international level as, as it would be within a, getting companies to collaborate. But a lot of these companies as well are multinationals. So, you know, they, they will be cognizant and aware and alert to what is happening in the legislation and their potential compliance for that legislation. So, you know, it almost feels like it's a good moment to be having these conversations. I have another question. I wonder if you could say a bit more about the gender dimension of equity in the cocoa value chain. Uh, you know, how do um, women and women's access to education and economic opportunities, uh, how does that impact kind of the potential for exploitation? And feel free to, um, inform us about not only the farmers, but the farm workers, mm -hmm. and then the degree to which they are even um, involved in wholesaling. Because as I understand it, there is some wholesaling that yeah. is still located um, in West Africa, and it's not um, fully outside of the world. Yeah. So Ghana has actually just recently announced the um, a, a, a large investment in processing within the country. Um, rather than uh, producing cocoa for exports, um, but on gender. So from this research and also from my experience of other research, the gender division of labour is very, very acute. Um, predominantly, the labour is done on the farm by the men, men and boys. Um, particularly, you know, the migrant workers are almost exclusively men. Women and girls, I would say, are largely invisibilized in the in not only in the in the value chain, but just invisibilized on the farm. Um, so a lot of women's labour sort of goes unacknowledged, um, particularly around you know. So the process of drying the beans, um, which is a is a intensive period of heating, drying, you know, cooking, all of that. Um, is largely ignored, particularly by a lot of research that looks at, at the, the work on the on the on the farm. Um, also, the, the 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 girls and the women are particularly involved in just producing food for the people who work on the farm. You know, so there's a there's a high level of invisibilization that happens there. What I was quite interested in seeing, though, was that actually quite a lot of the farmers, and farmers tend to be older, um, which I think is also an issue. Um, but a lot of um, the older farmers in particular regions were women. Um, and this apparently, and I'm not an expert in matrilineal um, inheritance laws, but um, other people are. <laughs> um, and they were explaining to me that actually this is about land um, and how land is... Um, exceeded so how, how land is inherited um, so there are there are a lot of overlapping gendered issues I think in terms of access to education then that's going to have a big role to play so for example there are particular seasons where the children will be kept at home you know if that is when the the, the, the beans need to be harvested or the beans need to be dried um, you know the preparation of the land there will be times seasonally that children will be kept at home. And we were told that a lot, um, that, you know, there were known times when children just wouldn't be in school. And that had a particular impact on, on girls, especially. Yeah. So we do have um, more questions from the audience. Um, does the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child have any attention? Um, how much can the UNA Commission on the Rights of Women and Children um, do to provide education, shelter, and other training to mitigate these enslavement? Sorry, could you repeat that question? Oh, my apologies. How much can the UNA Commission on the Rights of Women and Children do to provide education, shelter, and other training to mitigate enslavement? Okay. So, um, 
there is an African version on the, of the Convention of the Rights of the Child, um, which broadly mirrors the UN Convention. Um, and I think that there has been a lot of attention on that. Um, I think that the only difference really is around, um, there was an addition of um, a couple of words, which I can't recall the exact um, words, but it's something like, you know, um, responsibility to the family. So there was that, that aspect of, you know, children have rights um, within the family as well. Um, but broadly speaking, the, the conventions are, are, are pretty much the same. The, um, interestingly enough, in Ghana, in the government, their governmental approach is around women and children for particularly addressing child labour and slavery and trafficking. Um, so there is, there's a high level of sensitisation, like I say, around child labour issues in the in this in this uh in this sort of strategy to reduce child labor the bit that i would say is missing is children's rights to work so i'm not talking about you know um the worst forms of child labor i'm not talking about children under the age of 16. i would say specifically children 16 to 18 um are largely excluded from the cocoa sector because there is such a high sensitization but then you have this overlap with the issues around you know how do they then gain the skills the knowledge to inherit the farm to maintain the farm um so you know there are there are, there are multiple dimensions dimensions to this but i would say i would i would put that and i, I wrote about this recently in, a, in an article um actually in a book chapter uh for the university of west indies where we discussed particularly the dominican republic and their expansion of, of education um, as a way of trying to keep children away from farming. But actually, in reality, children just had to learn how to combine the farming and extended school hours um, in a way that actually didn't address children's rights in the, in the, in the way it was intended. So, you know, we need to have a, a much fuller conversation around children's rights from the positionality of children as well. Um, so yes, I would say that there is attention, that there, there, there could be more attention and there could be more diversity in those conversations. Um, absolutely, we saw that um, children were not regularly consulted in, in, in those processes, um, particularly in, in previous research in 2018. Um, so the next question was on the UN Commission on Women. Uh, yes. Does the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child have any attention? Was the first question. The second question: How can the UN Commission on the Rights of Women and Children um, provide education, shelter, and other training to mitigate this? Yeah. So I think that you know there is a role to be played in terms of particularly ensuring that um, women and girls are protected. Um, we we didn't pick up on sort of um, outright enslavement. You know, there's obviously exploitation, but I think that the link here is around exploitation linked to the value chain. So quite often farmers said, we don't want our children to be on the farms as much as they are. We don't want actually all of the families to be doing this. In the ideal world, we'd like to employ labourers to be doing this work, um, but actually we're not making enough money to enable us to do that. So I would, take it back to the point of that's the bit that really needs to be addressed. It's that inequity in terms of the distribution across the value chain. If that could be addressed, I think actually it would mitigate a lot of the other conse consequences for women and, and girls, women and children more broadly. Um, I think that um, there's, there's already quite a lot happening in Ghana, like I say, in terms of the government's approach is, is mostly focused on women and girls. Um, there's a, strategies in place around trafficking and slavery, not particularly focused on the on the, the cocoa sector, because like I say, it is more issues around exploitative um, environments that the that that women and girls, women and children find themselves in, as well as the farmers. So, you know, the entire um, farming community. But yes, you know, there, there is always more to be done. Um, and I think that there, there is certainly more to be done here. Um, but conversations that are led by the women, led by the children, you know, 
in order to meet their needs rather than what is assumed to be their needs is definitely the way forward. I have maybe a final question uh, for you about this excellent event. I wonder if you could say something about national differences within Europe when it comes to um, sort of what segment of the cocoa mm -hmm. value chain that different countries may be more concerned or may have more activity or legislation around when it comes to um, increasing equity, um, reducing or eliminating. Uh, slavery within the cocoa value chain. Um, just because I can imagine that there uh, may be differences between France and the UK and Germany, just based on the colonial legacies that these countries have had um, that differ quite um, substantially uh, when it comes to their links with these um, West African countries. Mm -hmm. So any insights that your research can offer that? Yeah. Well, we found that, um, you know, there was a high presence of particularly um, the Dutch and the German approaches to, because I think that their, their legislation is, is more advanced than the Modern Slavery Act. So mm -hmm. they are, you know, taking an approach of mandatory um, requirements, but also, I mean, the Netherlands are specifically talking about child labour. Um, so obviously that has a direct link. Um, I don't know in terms of, um, I mean, Ghana was, a, was, was occupied by the British. Um, there, are, there are remnants of previous occupations, I think, but majority, you know, um, is, you know, English speaking uh, interventions, um, which, you know, can also sometimes um, exclude farmers from some of the conversations. Um, so there tends to be more involvement of, of intermediaries, such as NGOs and civil society organizations. Um, but I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I'm fully understanding the question around. Well, if you don't mind, so for example, I assume Ghana is in the British Commonwealth. Yeah. Well, is. It, does that have a particular effect uh, that's different from France and the Francophone countries? In right, other words, exactly. if, from your question, yeah, it, I mean, yeah. how does the colonial legacy and the colonial trajectory and the idea that these European nations have that, you know, there's a francophone zone of influence sphere and a British, yeah. is that manifest or it's, it's not clear? I would say that it probably is. I mean, I don't really, I've not really thought about it from that perspective, um, but certainly, you know, the interventions in Cote d'Ivoire have, the French government are very much involved in those interventions. Um, there is a project that the Rainforest Alliance have just started um, looking at Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana. So that might have some interesting insights in terms of comparative um, of, of the, the sort of the, 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 the government interventions there. There's a lot of um, UK development uh, investment, maybe not so much now as there was previously um, after the... Uh, the closure of the de de Department for International Development. Um, but there was a lot of that development uh, investment focused on the cocoa sector. So, you know, sort of those um, strategies with the Ghanaian government was mostly with the UK government. Um, but interestingly, like I say, Germany and, and the Netherlands are, are very much involved in Ghana as well um, and funds a lot of um, projects and interventions and research. There's a, 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 a new research project by the Netherlands called DISCO. Um, I'm trying to remember what it stands for. I just remember the acronym because it's quite interesting. Um, but it's about supply chains and cocoa. Um, that's just started in Ghana. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, undoubtedly there are colonial afterlives, <laughs> and, you know, in terms of the, the relationships in the, in the cocoa sector in Ghana. Um, but that wasn't really what we were looking at. And yeah, I've not really thought about it from that perspective. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting one to think about. And like I say, the research that's happening in Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, maybe will will tell us a little bit more in terms of, you know, comparing the, the interventions and the, the impact of those interventions.
we do have we do have one final question, um, sort of on a similar topic as well. Do the terms of the loan convention at the end of colonial rule in West Africa contribute to inequality in the value chain? The terms of the loan convention? No, or L O M E. That could be mistaken. Yeah, it's lonely. Oh, the I country lonely. That's okay. My apologies. That's not something I am uh, an expert in at all, so I couldn't really respond. Um, I have no idea. I'm afraid I can't answer that question. So, unless anybody else wants to talk a little bit about the Lomé Convention. No, but I can tell you what disco means. Okay, <laughs> Grace. The Dutch Initiative on Sustainable Cocoa. There you go. And we can look up this Lomé a bit later. Yeah. So, I apologise to the question poser. I, that's not in my expertise. Wait, wait, any last questions? Okay. So I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks uh, to Dr. Vaughn for joining us here at the University of California, Berkeley uh, for uh, really uh, an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank uh, our co-sponsors of uh, the Institute of European Studies, the Institute for the Study of Societal uh, Issues, ISSI, the Center for African Studies, uh, the Institute for Research on Labor and Employment, and also the Berkeley Food Institute. I'd like to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Larissa Board, who's been behind the scenes, all of you in the audience uh, participating via Zoom, and all of you with me uh, in Moses Hall at UC Berkeley. Uh, many thanks again to our speaker, and I hope that you.